You're watching Cable 2. Good evening. Um, first, I would just like to call this meeting to order by standing for the Pledge of Allegiance, and then we will have our invocation. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Let us pray. Dear Lord, as always, we look to you for wisdom and guidance as we remain focused on our common commitment to put our children, educators, and community first. January is National School Board Recognition Month. As we celebrate this incredible opportunity to sit up here tonight, help us to understand the vital role that we play in our society and the importance of equally sharing our talents and God-given gifts to better our community. Please guide us through our decisions and thoughtful debate in a respectful and mind-kind manner. Help us to remember that we are stronger united and that together we can accomplish great things. God, please bless our meeting and bless our board members and their families. Amen. Thank you so much. Before we um, get to our business for tonight, I just wanted to take the privilege to say a uh, few things. First, I would like to say that um, last week we visited two of our schools, Meadowlark Middle School and Morgan Elementary School, and I can tell you that we witnessed exceptional teaching and learning, but I just wanted to send a special shout out to Morgan Elementary School, um, especially to the staff, students, and PTA. Um, I wanted to keep my word because the PTA asked that we show our swag bags that they gave us <laughs> um, during our meeting, so we were very appreciative of that. I too want to recognize the board members because this is um, National School Board Member Month, and I can tell you that I serve with a bunch of ladies that are not um, only beautiful but bold and caring and what I can say is that we all definitely care for our students we want every student in Winston-Salem Forsyth County student um, school to be successful and I also want to recognize the students that came to um, celebrate this month with us they were students from all across our district from the different high schools and they just left um, us a few minutes ago and it was an outstanding experience for the school board um, members and then lastly um, I know that MLK, we celebrated his life and legacy yesterday, but I do want to take the time to honor the life of Martin Luther King Jr. as not only a civil rights leader, but an international humanitarian whom we can all look as um, a leader and model of a life. And so I leave you with his quote that I find most inspiring. The function of education is to teach one to think intensively and to think critically. Intelligence plus character. That is the goal of true education. Thank you for giving me that privilege to say those few things and I will start now with um, the business for tonight. So first we will need to um, look at the agenda, review it, and try to make a motion to go ahead and pass. And if there are no changes, if I can get a motion um, to pass the agenda as written, All in favor? All opposed? Okay. Next we're going to um, go to special recognitions. Um, and we will have specific staff people that will come and help us to recognize some of um, the excellence that's in our school district with our students. Uh, first we will have Greg Gentry um, with the Winston-Salem Open Donation to um, Middle School Athletics. How are you? Good. Good to see you. Well, this is great. <laughs> All right. Thank you to the members of the board for uh, and uh, 
Chairman Woodbury and, and Dr. Emery for allowing me to speak. Um, because of the wonderful support that this board has given us and Dr. Emery has given us, we have had tremendous growth in our middle school athletics program. In the past couple of years, we've added four sports. We've added baseball, and we've added softball, and golf, and tennis, and as well as, as we've added the uh, sixth grade participation. So that has been a tremendous help, especially for our smaller schools. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to also recognize a tremendous financial partner that we have with our uh, Winston-Salem Forsyth County Schools Middle School Athletic Program. And in 2013, Mr. Oaks and the Winston-Salem Professional Tennis Board came forward and donated $10,000 to us. And that next year, we were able to start our middle school uh, cross-country program. <coughs> And so uh, this year it is my honor to be able to present to you Bucky Dame, he was a member of the Winston-Salem uh, Professional Tennis Board, and uh, he would like to make a presentation. Bucky. Thank you, Greg. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. And um, just want to uh, thank you for letting me take the opportunity to take this time tonight. I'm here tonight representing the Winston Open Tennis Board. Uh, it's it's uh, Chair Don Flo, it's staff, it's members, all the volunteers that make this a great event that takes place in late, late August each year. Uh, this will mark the ninth consecutive year that we will welcome many of the top men's players back to Winston-Salem for a week. Uh, the success of the tournament uh, allows us to make donations like this and to support middle school sports through either dollars or even tennis balls because we have a lot of them after the tournament. Um, and we feel that it's a very important component allowing the youth uh, to start and live and understand the benefits of a healthy lifestyle and to develop course character skills as part of something we feel very strongly about. Um, tennis is a sport that we need to continue to grow with our youth and we can't think of a better vehicle than working through the middle schools to, to, to teach uh, act being active to also to learn the sport of tennis and to hopefully develop some tennis fans. That's what we're after. And as we continue the, this process here, um, the more we can do to keep uh, tennis and the buzz of tennis with our youth and maybe it becomes more of an active lifestyle. So at this point, I would like to present uh, a check and I guess, uh, do, I, do I bring it up or do, does someone step up to present this? So, on behalf of the Winston Open, we'd like to present you a check of $10,000 wow. to support middle school sports and participation in middle school sports. And we'd like to thank you for the opportunity to, to make this happen. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Dion and Alex, make sure you get the check for me before I leave tonight. <laughs> Right. Okay. Um, next, um, I think we have Mr. John Sullivan, who's going to do presentations with our students, maybe? Yes. Good evening. Chairman Woodbury, members of the board, thank you for welcoming us here this evening. We're excited to recognize our 2018 North Carolina High School Athletic Association state champions for the fall season. Before we begin, I'd like to recognize the administrators from the schools that are going to be recognized tonight. So from Reagan High School, please stand when I call your name. Principal, Mr. Brad Royal, and Athletic Director, Ms. Alexis McCoy. And from East Forsyth High School, Principal, Mr. Rodney Bass, and Athletic Director, Mr. Alan Plaster. Thank you guys for all your support and encouragement of high school athletics and all that you do for our young athletes. So we'll begin with our individual girls, 4A girls, state champion from Reagan High School, Sasha Hayes. Over the course of two days, Sasha had a score of 144, day one, she shot a 74 
And on day two, she followed that up with a 70 to win the state title by six strokes. So congratulations, Sasha. And now to bring out her, her teammates who are the 4A girls golf team state champions from the Reagan Raiders. Come on out, girls. This was Reagan's first girls golf team state championship and second overall team championship for the school. Uh, coach, the coaches for the team were Jay Aldred and Mary Kate Choate. And Coach Aldred's gonna come up and say a few words about the team. Thank you all and uh, thank you board for your support of uh, women's athletics and I'd like to say uh, thank you to Mary Kate. Uh, she's just uh, a phenomenal help and coach and she also uh, teaches band at Haynes and she comes over uh, after teaching band all day and, and helps, uh, helps us with golf. But you know these girls here, to explain one thing about uh, women's golf, it, it is an individual sport that comes together as, to produce a team score. And so it's, it's dependent on each individual member to carry their weight and, and do their thing. And, and you know, these girls, they, they go out there and practice on their own all the time. We've got four seniors here, one freshman. And, and just to give you an idea of their commitment is uh, for the last two days, the freshman's been practicing outside in this cold. So if that tells you anything about these girls and their commitment, uh, that should be it. But it's, it's just a pleasure to uh, serve them and uh, to serve the citizens of this county uh, to help them out. Thank you. From my end is um, Sasha Hayes, Mary Slade White, Haley Bug Pollen, Sarah Young, Morgan Ketchum, and Coach Mary Kate Chip. Do we have parents? Do we have parents that we could recognize? Because we know that you're instrumental in their success as well. If you, if you're a parent, would you stand up? Because we want to thank you as well. So now we will bring out the 4A state football champions, your East Forsyth Eagles. This is East Forsyth's second state football championships. The last one was in 1992, and the school's third team state championship overall for the school. Head coach Todd Willard will come up and say a few words and introduce the team members. And when he introduces the team members present, if their parents are here, please stand and be recognized with your son. Thank you. First of all, thank you for having us here. Uh, it's a great honor to 
to be down here and uh, not be in trouble when you get down here. So I, I just want to make sure it's all is good. So I appreciate that. Um, no, we had a great season. Uh, a bunch of great young men here today. Um, once we heard that they're going to say every name, we didn't we didn't bring everybody here because I know people want to get home tonight. But uh, a lot of them are playing other sports. A lot of them work. They do a lot of things outside of football and and sports. And I think uh, right now we're in testing, so some people are home studying. And uh, you know that's what makes it so great to coach these young men is they have a great balance. Plus our trainer up here and young lady. Um, but just a great season to be perfect on the year and to be with a bunch of guys, honestly, that uh, put team first um, meant the world to us. And uh, just an honor, and we were glad we could represent Winston-Salem in the 336. Thank you. I'm going to have my assistant head coach here. He does all the names because I'm not very good with names. Uh, coach James Studevin, who's been with me since we started this uh uh, 16 years ago when I was hired by Ms. Ganey, so I'm going to have Coach Studevance, uh introduce all the guys here. Step forward and raise your hand. All righty. Thank you all for having us. Um, just going to dive right in. First up, Amani, Mar Amani Marshall, Nick Childs, Nate Wise, Joseph Brown, Ryan Ramsey, Sincere Patino, Thomas Howard Johnson, or Tomas, I'm sorry, Tomas, <laughs> Jacob Fletcher, Chase Yoder, Trey Ingram, Robin Smith, Chris Davis, Brendan Conway, Darren James, and of course Cheyenne Oldham, our trainer. And then you have Coach Damian Boo, and Coach Kenny Yoder on the end down there. Uh-oh, uh -oh, I'm sorry. And my friend Chris Chaplin. like to um, recognize our superintendent, Dr. Emery, to present, um... <laughs> oh my goodness, <laughs> she has a special recognition, so we want to. Good evening. We uh, wanted to just do a special thank you to our board members since this is Board Member Appreciation Month. And the best way to do that was with kids. So thank you so much for spending an hour of your time today with our high school kids. We use this time to give our board an opportunity to hear their voice and to uh, have good conversation with them. And I know uh, you enjoyed it. Uh, we also reached out to one of our rock star schools and asked them for a little help. And so I do just want to say a special thank you to Diggs Latham, um, Ted Burkaw, the principal is here um, tonight, and Rockstar art teacher Amanda Gordon and all things uh, 
uh, Diggs Latham Magnet. Uh, so we, we really can't take credit for this. We, we knew you would probably enjoy hearing from students. So I have a little, and I'm just going to keep them here and I'll take them back with me, but just a little something from the students uh, that they prepared for you to say thank you for your service at board, as board members. And then they also, with the help of our amazing uh, Channel 2 and communications team, have another little surprise for you. Hello from Diggs Latham Elementary, A plus magnet school staff and students. Our school board members, our students would like to say, create so many opportunities for many, many students. Our Honors Orchestra salutes you. May your year be wonderful. But if at any time your job seems difficult, just try some improvisation like our honors band working on jazz <laughs> our visual art students know, creativity is quite often the key when solving problems and making decisions. We are so excited for your future endeavors. We are literally jumping for joy. Remember, after a hard day's work, take your much deserved bow. So thanks again from the staff and students of Diggs Latham, especially the arts team. We hope you've enjoyed this tribute to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Emery, for putting this together for the um, school board. We really appreciate the hard work that you do here in our school district. Um, next, we're going to um, go to our public comments on the agenda items. Um, and I'll just remind um, those from the public that when you come up, you will have three minutes to um, address the board and 
you will see the timer to kind of keep you on task. And if there is um, anything that you need answered, of course, we always say that, you know, by way of our parliamentary rules, we don't comment back, but we are listening, we're taking notes, and you are free to go to um, Dion or Alex over here to the left, and they may be able to answer questions, and they may even direct you to some of um, our staff members in the back. And we are working diligently to figure out a way to communicate to the public so that you don't um, or feel or it appears that you're not, you know, we're not being responsive. Um, so with that being said, the first person on the list is John Coyne. I, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, my name is John Coyne. Uh, I live on 214 North Hawthorne Road. Uh, I've had kids who go through Brunson, uh, Wiley, Reynolds, as well as Atkins, uh, Paisley, um, and School Yard. So we've been around. But um, what I wanted to talk about was originally the, uh, the Buildings and Ground Committee meeting today. Um, we had seen on um, the agenda that there were several issues that were coming up primarily related to um, moving the uh, construction or really the demolition of the wild gym. And there were some concerns about that. I have some questions about that. Um, some are clarified, but there's still some questions that remain. One of those is, so as I understand it, the demolition, the demolition would happen earlier, a year earlier, but the students would not get the gym earlier. So that means that they are now out of the gym they would have to use of another one, I understand, but they have, would be displaced from that gym for three years. Um, another mm -hmm. question was, in order to move the, yes. uh, the demolition earlier, there would need to be a rental of a boiler uh, or some sort of system to heat, to heat the whole school, a heat boiler school, at a cost of $300,000 to $350,000. I, I don't understand why we're, you know, why are we doing that? Why are we spending that money? gym forward. And then the other one was, um, I think I already mentioned that, the displacement of the students. Um, I, I did learn today that the, the real reason is actually for the stadium. Um, at least that was made clear. Um, I have some questions back, you know, before you guys, and I'm, I'm glad you did not move this to the agenda today, because I think there are a lot of questions that need to be answered. I think there's a lot of people you need to listen to. I think you need to talk to the parents of Wiley in particular. This is going to really impact them. I think you need to talk to the neighbors around the schools as well, because this is going to impact all of them. And um, you know, I understand the passion around the stadium. There's also passion for a lot of other projects that need to happen to this school to make sure to the school system to make sure equity is across the school system. And I think one of the things that concerns me about moving it up is I live on that corner. It is a busy corner. And before you guys did the uh, traffic improvement, it was a nightmare and it was not safe. You all knew that. It was fixed. It was much better three months ago. Now it's a disaster again because of the I-40. It is really not safe anymore. And I, I encourage you to put more guards or staff out there because what's happening, students are jumping out of the cars before they get to the drop -off. So this is a big issue that has to be talked about as well. I don't think that we should do any construction project there until the high 40 work is done. So what we're to talk about, I please encourage you to talk to all the parties who would be interested. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Coy. The <coughs> next person is Mr. Alfred Harvey. Good evening, Chairman Woodbury, distinguished board, Dr. Emery. I come today to speak on behalf of the Reynolds High School Stadium project. I think it's a project that we need to go forward with, uh, keeping in mind that Reynolds High School has never really had a stadium of its own, and uh, all these other schools that were built, and when we constructed 
or, or gave money to refurbish and rebuild, uh, retrofit, or whatever you want to call it, uh, Mount Tabor Stadium. Uh, that money could have gone to Reynolds High School, school without a stadium. So I speak on behalf of uh, Reynolds High School getting a stadium. I will admit I'm a little biased because once Reynolds gets that stadium, then the school in my neighborhood, Parkland High School, would have their own stadium. So we won't have to share a facility with anyone. And I also want to talk about something else. The Ashley Elementary School site. I'd like for buildings and grounds, and I'd like for this board to hold meetings within that community to talk about a permanent site for a new Ashley Elementary School. I think you owe the community that. I don't, I don't like the fact that I hear we're going to put a school over here in this quadrant, that quadrant, but nobody's really talked to the people in the neighborhood about the school and where they would like to have one built. And I say that because I'm, I'm a firm believer that we're going to get us a new school because we have to get one. Uh, I've been in Ashley, and I will admit, paint and new lights shed light on a lot of things. But it does not hide what's been going on for years at Ashley Elementary School. We need a new school in that uh, neighborhood. And we, like I keep continue to say, we need a new school that emphasizes math and science because we have a lot of kids in that neighborhood with that potential that's untapped. And we need to tap into that and produce a new school that the community would be proud to have and that everybody would be proud to have. I know I would. Uh, every time I ride down 14th Street, I look over and I see that sign that talks about Zero 14th Street Elementary School. And uh, I talked with someone the other night and they said, there's no space. And I said, well, if you looked over there at East Winston Junior High School, you see they put three buildings on, three schools on one little set of property, one little set of land. So all of that can happen. It's just up to this board to make it happen. And I'd like for this board to rise up, do what they came here to do, and that is represent all the people, not just Kernersville, not just Walkertown, not just Clemens, but all the people in Forsyth County and Winston-Salem. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harvey. Next we have Mr. Ken Rashid. <coughs> Good evening. Good evening. About three years ago, the Winston-Salem LLC Education Ministry came to, to meet with members of the school board. The reason we met with them was because we were asking for a mandatory African-American history class. Now three years has passed and nothing positive has happened on that, that particular subject. It, we were fortunate enough to come to one of the curriculum meetings where the infusion model was discussed. It's my understanding that the infusion model started over 20 years ago. And one of the people that actually started, helped to start on that, uh, that model is, is here tonight. Now, 23 years has passed and nothing has happened. Wouldn't it be amazing if we decided, or you all decided, that European history should be an elective and African American history should be mandatory? this place would be full with white people that would be hesitant to even listen to what you all are saying about that. Just think about it. The only thing we've asked for is that you make the course mandatory. If, you do, if the infusion is there, then it should be taught. Right now we know, we can pretty much surmise that it's not being taught. When, when Willard Nash was here in the Multicultural Education Department, she linked up with the principals in the schools to make sure that it is being taught. I think we can pretty much surmise it's not being taught. There is no, I don't, I don't think there's a, anything in place to actually prove to us 
that is being taught. Once again, we're asking for a mandatory African American history class. We believe that African American history benefits all students. And it's not just solely for, for us. It would be good if all kids knew different cultures and it probably would make, a better, make for a better society. Um, one of the other things that we talked about that we don't get much information on is who is going to head the multicultural education department, how many staff members would they have, and is, would that be sufficient to cover all the schools? At one point, we let Nashville covering all the schools, which is virtually impossible. Audits were supposedly done. They were dismal at best. And we, again, we talk about transparency. You talked about transparency on your, on your, on your campaign. And we need to know, as a collective community, what you all are doing about what we're asking for as far as the Af mandatory African American history. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rashid. Next, we have um, Amatullah Salam or Salim. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, Tamara Woodbury and your staff. First, let me state that the local organizing committee of Winston-Salem is most grateful for the tremendous effort that the Winston-Salem Forsyth County Board Curriculum Committee has made towards assisting our labor of striving to correct the omission of black history from American history in the Department of Social Studies. Once again, we are requesting that you tell the whole truth about black history to the students of the Forsyth County School System that our tax money supports. You have made an agreement with the citizens of North Carolina that the North Carolina County School Systems would not allow racism within your educational curriculum. Yet, you continue to violate your agreement by omitting, omitting facts revealed in the contributions of black history through the devious method of elective instruction by your teachers. A verbal apology from the mayor, the trustees of Old Salem, or BBNPT Bank is insufficient without concrete action to address the damage that continues to be done to the children of the Forsyth County School System. This failure causes a misinterpretation of self-identity which automatically continues to perpetuate racism. We are not asking you to reveal how we were brutalized or terrorized for over 400 years, no. We are asking that you include the black history that was and still is an integral part of building the wealth that you enjoy today. Include black history that created the financial foundation that established Wall Street through our 400 years of free labor by our ancestors who were kidnapped and enslaved from Africa. This is why we are eternally grateful to program specialist Dr. Willette Nash and her staff for the excellent infusion of black history into social studies as well as the sensitive manner in which they handled this delicate challenge by being aware of the various nature of parents and students involved in this forward move of educational paradigm. However, in view of continued obstacles inferred by some teachers of insufficient preparation time to reveal the whole story of American history, insufficient resources, and the human will we are requesting that a system of checks and balances be an integ integral part of this infusion to assure its correct implementation. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Ms. Rhonda Mays. Good evening. Good evening. Chairwoman Woodbury, the board, and Dr. Emery. 
I am Rhonda Mays, a school social worker here in the district, and I serve as full-time release president of Forsyth County Association of Educators. I wanted to come before you this evening to speak about the Buildings and Grounds discussion concerning the Wally Gym and the stadium. As we went through a process of placing items on the bond and preparing for the submission to the county commissioners. That process was talking to the community and having meetings in the community. If there's going to be any changes to what was presented to the community, it needs to be brought back to the community. It is not fair for people to think that things are going to be one way and then when we look up, it has changed. This was a practice that happened in the past and we thought we were past that and it was not gonna happen this time. So let's please make certain the community is included in any decisions that happen with the monies that are, that's come from the bond. You know, because that does represent transparency for everyone. And we wanna make certain that it's not said in the end that the board deceived the community by not sticking to the plan that you had at hand. No one is saying that Reynolds doesn't need a stadium. But just as anything else, everything has a time and a process. Because as what was said earlier and what has been said at many other school board meetings, Ashley needs a new school. So if we want to put something higher on the priority list, let's get a new school for Ashley. Because that's someplace where the children are each and every day learning. And their development is essential to their environment in which they are being taught. So we believe in equality of our resources throughout this district. But we also want to make certain that we're being transparent in how we do this. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mays. Next we have Langdon Operman. I think that's the correct. Hey, thank you. Um, there was this discussion in the Buildings and Grounds Committee about changing or eliminating a memorandum about money for the stadium. Uh, several years ago, a private group raised money to renovate Reynolds Auditorium at Reynolds High School. It was a big project and they raised a lot of money and uh, near the end they ran out of money and the school system had to pay to complete the project. The school system got burned and the taxpayers got burned and so that school board said future projects would be approved only if the private group had all the money in the bank before the project began. And so when the stadium came up and the private group was raising the money, that's why this, this last board made that provision and that all the money for the stadium should be put into the bank before the project starts. According to the Winston-Salem Journal a few months ago, only a small percentage of the money has been raised and I, I urge you to protect the taxpayers protect the county, protect the school system, and keep the memorandum in place as it is. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Oberman. Next we have Steve Rapp. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Steve Rapp. I live at 1535 Overbrook Avenue. I've sent two kids through the system, and I'm very satisfied with the education they got. Love sports. Don't like the idea of the stadium wedged into that space, but that's not what really sets my hair on fire. What sets my hair on fire is the lack of transparency and the backroom shuffling that appears to be going on with taking money from this initiative that was going to be, the stadium was going to be a gift to the community, and now it's being passed on to the taxpayer. This is not only unfair, but it's unconscionable. That money should not be spent on a stadium, I believe, when we have 
much more important needs. Ashley's been mentioned several times, couldn't agree more. We have educational needs, we have material needs, we have personnel needs. What in the world are we doing funding a stadium with public dollars? I would encourage and hope you would think about that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rapp. Um, next, we have Ann Urban. Hello. Good evening. Hey, good evening. I'm Ann Urban. I live at 168 North Hawthorne Road. Um, and I also, I'm, a, I'm terrible at speaking in situations like this, but luckily there have been some much more articulate people in front of me. I am also here to talk a little bit about the um, Wiley Gym situation. And this woman said exactly what I would like to say very articulately. I think I just want to emphasize communication and transparency. If that doesn't happen, you're going to have a lot of trouble on your hands. That's what I'd like to say. Thank you, Ms. Urban. Next, we have Mr. Al Jabbar. Good evening again, Board Chair. Good evening. Members of the Mississippi Forsyth County School Board, Dr. Emery. You know, on last Saturday, I picked up on paper, and I will ask you if you would extend me maybe two minutes. I picked up on paper and I saw this schools lag, still lag, and racial equity. Report card meant as call to action to help young people of color. Mr. Jabbar, before you finish, I wanted to clarify that what you were going to talk about as it relates to the curriculum piece was um, what we had discussed in our previous curriculum committee meeting when you went there with what was in the paper with equity. I don't know if that was on our curriculum agenda, which means you could come back at the public comment section and do your three minutes. Uh, so what? Let me, let me ask you this, uh, board chair. Mm -hmm. uh, what I'm going to talk about in terms of curriculum is the fact that uh, we don't have reading intervention at some of our low performance schools. Yeah. So I would ask that you do public comments, if if that's okay with you. I appreciate well, it. I know. Well, I should have okay said that, but I'm just trying to keep the order of the agenda correct. So I appreciate your patience. Okay. Thank you, sir. Next, we have uh, Miss Sally Hirsch. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I'm here in support of cultural studies as mandatory. I know you're talking about the African American um, history class. Uh, I just want to expand it a little bit. Last night I was so moved by Reverend William Barber II speaking on the occasion of MLK Day and bringing to light the urgency of our time to root out racism in all of its present forms. From the school to prison pipeline to the lack of jobs and living wages, and affordable housing, from the border and immigration battles and to the threats to clean water and air on native lands and uh, in our urban and rural areas. I thought to myself, how could this beautiful experiment in diversity, the United States, e pluribus unum, come to such destructive times? One need look no further than the current power structure that would impose a monoculture. Uh, that is why we must criti critically look at our multicultural programs in our schools. With such diversity that exists in the Winston-Salem Forsyth County Schools, in the student populations, why is it that we're still relegating multicultural studies to elective status or even uh, speaking in terms of infusion um, or integration instead of foundational knowledge of cultures that really were foundational to the development of our country. This can only be because the dominant culture and power structure wants to keep the upper hand. 
But in so doing, it has brought us not only immense social unrest, that's what we have right now, and also we're at the precipice of self-annihilation. Our ecosystems are failing. They are failing. We, we, we have to talk about climate change. Because monoculture is winning the race. Now is the time for multicultures to stand strong and reclaim their foundational value to this country. The recent election bringing to power African Americans, Native Americans, Muslim Americans, LGBTQ, Hispanic, Latino, and other cultures is a great sign of hope. But we must embrace this, the histories and the her stories of these different cultures in our schools right now as told from the perspectives from these cultures, not from somebody else's perspective on integrating these cultures in. And we should also consider the marginal stories within the dominant culture, such as those of the working poor, women, and other groups. These stories must be part of the very heart and soul of our curriculum. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hirsch. Next, we will have Kevin Bynes. Good evening. How Good evening. Um, I came to speak about the African American history curriculum. Uh, I think this year, some say it would be 400 years since that first African American came on these shores. Um, some say 1555, but I think the, the dominant date is probably about 1619. Um, you know, when you deny people the opportunity to uh, learn about themselves, uh, you disable them to some degree. Um, you don't give, you don't empower them. I think we can all agree that history is about informing people. It's about empowering people. Um, and if you look at the way that European history has been taught to us from day one, and our own selves, our, our own history has been kind of put to the side and, and not, not given to us unless we go looking for it. And we shouldn't have to look for it. We should be able to uh, go into a class um, and have that without, without making it an elective, but having it mandated. We should be able to go to a class and learn everything that we need to know about African Americans. And everyone would benefit from it. We wouldn't have that situation. I can't say we wouldn't have it, but we wouldn't have, uh, um, I guess, a, a big effect that, that we're having in terms of students not passing their, their, their grades students not knowing um, who they are because if they knew that they came from someone that 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 their ancestors like mines helped build the infrastructure of this country the economic engine that america is today um, i think you would see a, a difference but when you give person when you give a a, a people uh, an image you say that the greeks created politics the greeks created democracy well, we know that's a lie because the Greeks studied in Egypt. We know that they learned everything they did from the Egyptians. And so the fact is, is that we need to empower our students with that knowledge. We need to teach them that algorithm, uh, not algorithm, but the, uh, what is it? The Pythagorean theory was something learned by the Greeks in Egypt. And that uh, Imhotep taught that. A black man, they need to be empowered. And when you empower black students, when you empower other students, people of color, you empower white students, you empower everybody. Because we all know that everything started in Africa. We don't, we don't learn about Ivan Van Sertima before, before Columbus. We don't learn about Chancellor Williams, the destruction of black civilization. We don't learn about anything like that in, in these schools. And every single student needs to learn that so they can have a better perspective, not just a white perspective, but a whole global perspective in a perspective that is, that is uh, from a people that have been here since time immemorial. And that's all I want to say. Two, 
400 years, 1690. Thank you, Mr. Bynes. Next we have, um, I think, Ms. Michelle Jordan. Good evening, Dr. Emery and board members in Woodbury. Um, Good evening. I came to speak to you about a policy change. And um, before I left tonight, I was watching the weather. And of course, they're talking about the impending winter ice again tomorrow morning. And if we end up having a delay, the message will go out that will speak to student safety, but will say nothing about the safety of the staff. And why are we not included? Um, why is our safety not a priority? Why not treat us like the professionals we are, especially since you know most of us go in early in the morning, stay late, work on weekends. We're already putting in beyond those two hours. Um, and I've spoken with some of you, and part of what has come up in the past, I don't know, few months is the fact that we have very low staff morale in our district. And something like this would be speaking to the low morale and would give that, you know, back to the staff. Um, on social media, when the last delay happened, there was some comments put out there about why does it not include for the staff, and there was a constant um, message that kept getting put back from the school system that if you are concerned or feel unsafe, contact your administrator. Well, you have some administrators who flat out say no. I can get here, you can get here, you're going to get here on time. Then you have some that take the middle ground and say yes, you can have a delay, but if you come in two hours late, you're going to stay two hours today to make that up. And then you have some that recognize the time that their staff put in and don't require that they come in and that they can stay as a delay. And they know that I'm not going to have them make up their time because they were here earlier this week or they stayed after for something until 5 o'clock the other day. Um, when you talk to different people, and I know you've heard stuff from various members in the school system, but there are reasons that people want a delay. They don't feel safe driving in. Some of them have their own children with them and need to drive in. Some people are not working within our county, and they're driving from outside of our county and are dealing with road conditions coming in. So it's just something that I want you to look forward in considering to a policy change. It would go a lot for the morale of our staff, and it would make us feel like we're respected and our lives are valued just like the lives of our students. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jordan. We didn't have a policy oh, meeting today. Was it was, but I, that's why I gave you the, you know, the latitude for that. Yeah, we, well, we had to cancel it. No problem. Um, the <laughs> next person we have is Ms. Katie Sonnen Lee. I apologize if I'm a little discombobulated. I have sick kids and there's snow tonight. Mm. <laughs> I did think so. I apologize if I'm a little out of sorts. But I just wanted to echo and elevate and amplify the voices of all the people that have already spoken, um, especially about equity in the community. And I really appreciate hearing other members of the community that we don't usually see here talking about it. Um, it's a huge concern for me and my family. And I want to talk about the building and grounds um, that's on the, on the uh, agenda. I know y'all are talking about the stadium. We know that's been an issue and a conversation in our community for a while. But like other speakers have said, we have schools that are in dire need of replacement and students should not be in those schools when the conditions are what they are. Ashley Elementary is a perfect example, but we know it's a symptom of a bigger problem. There are more schools in this community. We've heard from teachers from Diggs Latham and other schools that have come to speak here various meetings about the situations their schools are in with leaking roofs, which obviously is going to cause mold long term, which is <clears throat> the problem at Ashley. And the federal government is investigating the school system about that right now as we speak. Um, so I just want to amplify again that Action for Equity is asking the school board to address the issues at Ashley and re resolve the federal civil rights complaint and build a new school for Ashley in the community with community input so vital and so important. We're also asking that y'all develop a matrix and infrastructure to identify resources and infrastructure needs at each school and that each school every year would get a survey of what they need and what those challenges are because again like I said we know Ashley is just a piece of that puzzle of what's happening at other schools. 
Um, for example, my son attends Spees, which is a fantastic school, but he's in the trailers in the back. And these days when it's freezing rain, when I walk him to school, he's walking through that out to his classroom to go into specials, to go to the cafeteria, all that stuff. There's no cover. That, he's in first grade. I mean, that pales in comparison to what's happening at Ashley, but there's schools all over that need a lot of infrastructure support before we need a sports stadium. Um, and then I also want to talk about the African American curriculum. <coughs> Sorry, I have a cold. And um, give my support for that. And everybody has said amazing things here tonight, but I also wanted to, again, bring up the racial equity report that came out from the Youth Justice Project of the Southern Coalition for Social Justice. One thing that really, really, really stuck out to me, in this district, 38% of the students are white. 38%. 74% of the teachers are white. That's almost double. 74%. 65% of the principals are white. 50% of the assistant principals are white. I'm not that good at math, but two out of nine of y'all are not white on this board. Like that speaks to something, some symptom of a bigger problem that we're not addressing in this community. Thank you, Ms. Sonny. <laughs> Lastly, we have Emily Schultz. Evening. I'm going to be brief because people said what I was going to say better than I could say it. But um, I just want to express my support for the mandatory African American Studies history class and the curriculum infusion that was pre presented to the curriculum committee um, last week. As a white person with white children, I believe it is imperative for my children to know that history and life does not revolve around white people. Um, in spite of what our society and our culture and our history books might tell them otherwise. Um, yes, it's my job as a parent to teach them this, but it should also be the job of the school system to teach facts that do not misrepresent or omit groups of people and events. Um, my elementary school daughters came home today talking about how they learned about Martin Luther King Jr. at school. Um, I asked my kindergartner if she learned that he was assassinated. She said no. Um, you know, she's five, but that's the truth. So there's that. Um, my third grader said, I learned that Dr. King, uh, because of Dr. King, schools are no longer segregated. Ooh. Um, so we had a conversation about that. But um, Dr. King, a prominent figure, a national holiday for him, and we still can't get the narrative right of what we're teaching our kids. Um, how can we expect our teachers to teach this really, what can be really challenging subject matter without the supports um, that they need and the education that they need? Um, I went through the curriculum infusion that was presented to you all last week, um, and I hope that you all will um, pass, vote to whatever you need to do to make that happen. It seemed like Ms. McKnight and her team really did their work and put in lots of um, recommendations to support the teachers and staff and put in checks and balances to, to get this um, curriculum not only infused, but they changed it to integrated, which is a step in the right direction. Um, I even looked at the supplemental material and there are many things there that I had never heard of about, um, never seen before. Maps of slave routes, maps of the empires of Africa, these things I had never learned. I minored in history in college, never seen them before. And that, I know that's on me too, but um, I've gotten this far in life and there's a whole lot of history that I have not been exposed to or challenged by or been able to celebrate. I don't want this for my children or any other children, and I will hope I hope you agree and will continue to work for equity and change in how our history is presented. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Schultz. <laughs> Next, we are going to our discussion items, and first we have um, Ms. Paula Grubb. She's going to talk to us about the MOU between Family Services Inc. and Winston Salem Forsyth County Schools. Good evening. I'm Paula Grubbs. I'm the Pre-K Program Manager for our district, and I'm here to talk to you a little bit about our partnership with Family Services Head Start. To tell you a little bit about our district commitment for 
early learning, we provide programs for students who are at risk. And our goal is to promote child development, engage our families in learning, and improve academic outcomes and later school experiences. We have 729 students in 49 classrooms, and they're funded in a variety of ways. Title I, NC Pre-K, Project Impact, EC Preschool, and then Family Services Head Start. And um, these commitments are seen as so important that they're now part of our ESSA plan, Every Student Succeeds Act. So these Head Start Partnership classrooms are three preschool classrooms serving a total of 54 students. The classrooms are at Griffith Elementary, North Hills Elementary, and Old Town Elementary. And it's interesting that as we fund classrooms in different ways, there are different eligibility criteria with every funding stream. So for these classrooms, students meet Title I criteria as well as Head Start criteria. So we have several guiding principles in our partnership. So to me, the most important ones, while they're all important, are number one, creating and maintaining a meaningful partnership so we do impact student outcomes, planning, implementing, and monitoring evidence-based strategies, supporting our families, supporting transition from early care, early childhood, and kindergarten, or as I call it, big school, and then supporting a early childhood system in our community. So these are our costs, and it's um, important to know these are for this fiscal year. So that's really it. I know you've looked at our memorandum of understanding. If you have any questions, I'm happy to address those at this time. Okay. okay. I have a question. Sure. Do, and it's not necessarily around this, but all of our, um, as you pointed out, we have various uh, partners that help us uh, mm -hmm. with, with our pre-K classrooms. At, at one time, those, depending on the funding source, there was a different curriculum taught maybe so you could have two classrooms side by side, but maybe they were, we were using a different curriculum. Do we now have all the same curriculum? We do. We have the same curriculum across all our pre-K classrooms and EC preschool classrooms. <coughs> we do have some additional supplementary curriculum that we use, but we have a primary curriculum in common. And that curriculum is aligned with our kindergarten curriculum as well. Okay. Other questions? Okay, thank you. Next we have um, the Building and Grounds Committee report from board member Leah Crowley. Thank you, Chairman Woodbury. Um, let's see here. From buildings and grounds today, we had uh, several discussion and action items. First up was the education lottery funding, and we voted in favor of using that funding to retire um, the debt on the bond that was used for capital improvements in the school system. Uh, the next item was the child nutrition procurement plan, and we voted to approve that. Um, next up was the bond. Uh, update as far as it applied to technology and Mr. Sherrill let us know about the uh, a few uh, a little bit over 2,000 classrooms that had been completed with the technology update um, and then possibly changing the plan um, from a scheduling standpoint with the remaining classes to implement partially um, the installation of the active boards um, and make sure that they're installed in all classrooms and hold back on another piece of the technology part so that everybody could move forward with the part that was most um, important for instruction. And we also discussed, as mentioned in some of the public comments tonight, the Wiley Middle School Edition. Um, it is part of the 2016 bond and has already been approved to be paid for out of this bond and the discussion was over moving this project moving it up so moving it to uh, sooner uh, by approximately 
four months is what we're looking at. Um, and that was voted on today and passed Buildings and Grounds to, to start that project approximately four months earlier than what it is on the current bond schedule. Thank you. Um, although on the agenda here it has Lida Calvert Hayes would do the policy committee report, we didn't have the policy um, committee meeting, and she doesn't have a microphone. And of course, <laughs> I would share mine, but since they didn't have a meeting, I think we could um, just move to um, board member and vice chair Barbara Burke to give us the curriculum committee report. Good evening. The curriculum committee met on January 15th, 2019, and there were several discussion items and uh, two action items. Principal Trent Watkins of Forest Park Elementary School discussed the proposed TNTP contract, the new teacher project, to be funded with Title I funds. According to the contract, TNTP would provide professional development opportunities for teachers and staff at Forest Park, and the focus of the training would be to support the teachers and staff with improving outcomes for English language learners. Principal Watkins invited four of his very outstanding and enthusiastic teachers to give testimonials of the anticipated benefits of the professional development opportunities. School Board Chair Woodbury made a motion to address, adjust the contract to include TNTP coaches providing direct modeling for students, Forest Park students, also a lot for on-site professional development for all teachers and staff, and adjust the timeline to reflect the correct schedule and timeline, as well as adjust the cost to reflect the corrected timeline and schedule. The curriculum committee voted and, and approved the motion to adjust the TNTP contract. Homan Atashbar, Director of Student Assignments, reviewed the Winston-Salem Forsyth County Assignment of Pupils Policy 5117 with emphasis on direct domicile, magnet schools, and alternative programs, elementary, middle, and high schools. He explained the process and timeline for student assignment, magnet, and school choice. He also noted the dates that all applicants would receive a letter with results as well as the process to appeal. Rebecca McKnight, Social Studies Director, stated that the African American Infusion Project began in the mid-1990s as a way to help African American students see themselves within the K through 12 curriculum. Curriculum audits of middle and high school social studies courses were done then to assess the presence of African American history, culture, and perspective within instruction. According to Ms. McKnight, teachers have worked on creating and revising the curriculum before and after the implementation of the social studies essential standards uh, in 2012. In the summer of 2017, teachers focused on developing curriculum writing on the secondary level, and in the summer of 2018, curriculum development focused on eighth grade inquiry units and elementary lesson plans. Ms. McKnight invited five elementary teachers to share how their lesson plans were Im implemented in their classrooms and the positive impact the students received as a result of the instruction. Professional development is planned during the 2019 spring semester to support the eighth grade inquiry unit, 
She also plans to continue working on creating and integrating lesson plans in collaboration with the Office of Early Learning, Teacher Academy, and the Elementary Language Arts Department. Summer of 2019 plans will include an audit plan for elementary classrooms and develop monitoring tools for schools to use during administrative walkthroughs. Ms. McKnight will begin working on Latino-Hispanic integration uh, and, and infusion project by developing lessons based on text for K through 5. She is interested in creating a task force made up of stakeholders such as teachers, community members, parents, and people in higher education to share ideas about equity with a continued focus on African American cultural and perspective. And finally, Dr. Kenneth Symington, our Deputy <laughs> Superintendent, requested approval for updated courses for high school registration. The request was made to add AP World History to the courses aligned with college and career ready guidelines. The committee voted and approved. <coughs> the approval was unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair Burke. Next, we are going to uh, move into our action items. The first item is to consider approval of the MOU between Family Services, Inc. and Winston-Salem Forsyth County School. Um, is there a motion? Second. So we have a motion by um, Leah Crowley, and then there's the second by um, Barbara Burke. Um, are there any questions or discussion? Okay. All in favor? Okay, so it's unanimous. The next item is the um, com uh, consider approval and authorization of the education lottery fund for payment um, 2007 A through 2008 bond debt service. Um, is there a motion? Motion by, again, Board Member Crowley. Second by Board Member um, Lori Goins clark um, Is there any discussion, any questions? Okay, all in favor? This passes unanimously. The next item is the approval of the Child Nutrition Procurement Plan. Second. Second. Um, Se second was... Um, oh. So the, the motion was by Lida, board member Lida Calvert Hayes in the second. It was by board member Deanna Kaplan. Are there any questions or comments, discussion? All right, all in favor? All right, it passes unanimously. The next item is the approval of the TNTP professional development contract for Forest Park Elementary School. Chairwoman, I move that we table the discussion on the approval of the TNTP contract because we, uh, as the curriculum committee, um, requested some changes and we're waiting for those changes to be received. We spoke with Dr. Emery today and we said that each committee member would have an opportunity to provide those changes to me. I will compile those revisions and get them to Dr. Emery by Friday. Um, we feel that uh, the contract should come back through the curriculum committee because the, curricula, the curriculum committee requested those changes. So it is expected that those changes, those revisions come back through curriculum. And once we have verified them, we will move them on. I second the motion to table. Yes. The, well, first, from I was, yeah. We have to see the second for that one we Exactly. I was getting ready to address that. Thank you. Is there a second for the original motion by Chairperson um, Elizabeth Motzinger? Um, there's the yeah, second by um, Board Member Lori Goins Clark. Is there any discussion? Comments? I, I, I just need clarification. Ms. Burke. Are there additional, I know that um, Chairwoman Woodbury had some suggestions and you spoke about that in your um, 
in your committee report do we have additional um, questions is that what you're saying that committee members have some additional things as well as wanting to see the contract go through committee I'm just trying for clarification uh, they are the same revisions that you received January 17th as well as in the curriculum meeting mm -hmm. um, and with one addition but we want to give each committee member an opportunity to put in writing after they have taken a look at the contract any revisions that they would like to see in addition thank you for the clarification and I guess um, Chairwoman Woodbury is this the new um, procedure um, for all contracts to go through committee or, or, or is this just kind of on a case-by-case -case basis? So we don't have a new procedure. This is strictly for the, um, the Forest Park Elementary School and what I will add is that we are working to um, expedite um, this contract um, just, uh, but before so so and, w and what I mean by that um, board member um, Mott Singer is that our, our plan is to get the information as quickly as possible by Thursday um, to the chairperson, um, Robert Burke, um, for the curriculum committee and then um, hopefully and ideally, you know, call a special meeting to have the contract go through um, by no later than Tuesday by way of a vote. So that's, that's kind of what we foresee right now. Um, so... Are there any other questions or comments? So yes. Does that mean that we have called a special meeting of the board that has been scheduled because they have to have for us to be 40, able to 48 vote? That, that, that's why I said the plan is, so we haven't done it yet. So I think, Ms. Monsinger, that means that they know this is not going to pass. And so they're already planned for a called meeting, even so though there's a motion meeting, and a second. No, to that's, that's this contract. I'm, that's, I'm, I'm that's, just confused. yeah. So that's not the case that we know if it's going to pass or not. Ob obviously not. So the again, the meeting, the special committee, the, the special meeting will be to get the contract before the board member after the curriculum committee members have an opportunity to make sure that those items that were um, amended and agreed to have actually been um, agreed to. So not all of the members have been given that opportunity. So the curriculum committee is going to get an opportunity to weigh in and then after that we will call a special meeting of the board to approve this contract? Yes, so then we will be able to vote um, as a board. But we have a motion and a second to approve exactly. it now. So I just wanted to respond to this questions that board member Motsinger had. Okay, so are there any more questions or discussion? Okay, all in favor for the motion to approve the contract as he is now? Okay, all opposed? All right. Is there another um, motion? By, oh, Board Member Burke, could you repeat the motion that you had? The motion? The motion is to table the contract until all commi curriculum committee members have an opportunity to submit revisions for the contract. They will give their uh, revisions to me by Thursday. I will get those revisions to Dr. Emery by Friday. And then on Tuesday, we will call a special emergency board meeting so that all board members can vote on the revised T and TP contract. Just a question. I, can, so can I we second the motion. Okay, yeah. So there's a second by board member um, Crowley. Are there any discussions, questions? I just, it sounds yeah. like the curriculum committee is supposed to revise a contract. Do you mean just the, the date change and the little things that you requested? You're not yes, talking about. exactly. We're not going to revise a contract. Yeah, just no. the simple changes that you requested. Is that right? Yeah. 
I should just leave my mic on. Yes, those changes that I emailed everyone January 17th, in addition, we have maybe two more small revisions, not anything major. Like not rewinding the words, just like little date changes and money. Very small yeah. changes, okay. yes. Okay. But the services that um, the school will receive are pretty much the same. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. Um, all in favor? Okay. All opposed? All right, so the motion carries through um, stated by um, Vice Chair Barbara Burke. Um, the next item on the um, for approval is the 2018-19 budget amendment number three and transfer number three. Is there a motion? I, I put a motion in. Okay. Second. Second. All in, well, is there any questions, comments, discussion? All right. Uh, all in favor? Okay. That passes unanimously. Thank you. Uh, the next item is our consent agenda items, and um, do we have a motion to approve the meeting minutes for January 8th, 2019, and also the approval of the general personnel report? Motion to approve. Second. Did, did you get that? Okay. Thank you. Um, are there any questions, concerns? Okay. All in favor? passes unanimously. All right, the next item is our um, open meeting to the public, and I would just remind um, the public that you have three minutes um, to address the board, um, and of course we have the timer there. And since we moved Mr. Jabbar to this part of the um, public comments, and he was so gracious to um, wait, then we will have him first, right? Um, and then we'll move forward. Thank you. Since I've been before you already and acknowledged who you are, let me start out by saying this. 